Synced. Uh, 17 minutes past eight, AUT lecturer Ella Henry joins me on the panel. Ella, good to have you back. Uh, and lawyer and political commentator Vernon Tava uh, is with me too. How are you, Vernon? Very good, thanks, Paul. All right, let's start talking about this uh, Kumar trial, um, which just for the Kumar family, further devastation. First of all, they have to put up with the horrendous crime that was committed against their family, losing their father, um, their husband, um, and... Now they have to put up with this, Ella. It doesn't seem, does it, like justice has been done to them? I think if you lost a family member in such a tragic way, there is no way that there would be justice. I mean, even if both boys were found guilty and went to jail for the rest of their lives, they would still have a right to feel aggrieved. Mm -hmm. So we have to follow the process of law. We have to trust in our judicial system. It has come up with this outcome. And I just feel huge sympathy for the family, but nothing that happened to those boys would ever really, I think, ameliorate the tragedy. One of the, one of the sad things is obviously the Crown decided, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, Vernon, um, to to not seek to pursue other charges mm. on the younger child, which left the jury with no no alternative other than to see him set free. That's right. It was accessory to manslaughter or nothing. So, look, I mean, manslaughter is no light charge. That's an extremely serious charge. You know, you've still killed someone. Mm. It's just that you didn't have the requisite intent. Um, so, you know, the, the fact that the younger boy, and they are both boys. These are both children. I mean, they're a long way from the age of adult responsibility. You know, so... How many things have gone wrong in their lives, you know, for, for them to have been in that situation? But at what point, and this is the interesting thing, because we know that, and the Kumars mm. had to sit through and listen to this Absolutely. litany of tragedy. Oh, it's but terrible. how how much of that do you take into account when someone's life has been taken away? Isn't there a certain point that you have to say, look, that's really, you just got to suck up all that horrible stuff mm. because their parents, who should also be in the dock, mm. were not. Mm. Um, so at some point, surely you've got to just say, look, this is the crime. This is what we're talking about, the crime you committed. Look, and deeper sympathies to the family. It's a horrible thing to have to go through. But what do we gain by being purely punitive to what is clearly a pretty broken child, you know, who's, who's the well, word what are is we they have brain damage you know, I, I and, know and what need our help rather okay. than just being punished. We're not going to help them, are we? So it's not like there's an alternative which is better because w w w this is a litany that we could have predicted, isn't it? This younger child is just going to be returned to the same environment that, that bred him. I remember Celia Lashley saying this 20 years ago, that there, there are areas of our country where uh, little time bombs are being created yep. and we don't... In fact, that's exactly the word she used, that's little right. time bombs. And uh, and we don't still, 20 years later, and Celia's passed on, have created the infrastructure to ensure ways of defusing those time bombs. We wait until they go off, we weep, we wail, we gnash our teeth, but until we get to the infrastructure of supporting, you know, making stuff stronger and better, then these little time bombs are going to go off that's over That's precisely and over again. the point. And talking about how we should punish the individual person person more or more strongly misses that point and it misses those really hard questions we need to ask ourselves of what are we doing to stop this from happening again. But you know here it is, it's 2015, we're still asking ourselves those questions or avoiding asking those questions, mm. whereas not addressing the issue at all. Mm. I mean this 14 year old um, who's just been found guilty of manslaughter um, is one of 10 children. The youngest child was born only a couple of weeks ago to a breeding machine who clearly is not meeting her obligations of care and nurturing. Um, child, youth and family are periodically taking care of these children. We're just breeding more problems, aren't we? Well, I mean, we could take people who potentially might be a problem behind the bike shed and put them down, but I don't think we've become that society yet. So if we haven't become that society, consciously and politically, then we have to work at how we design, you know, 20 notifications to SIFs for yeah, this one yeah, boy. Yeah. 20. Why was they're not more infrastructure to remove him and put him somewhere safe, to implement counselling, to protect the housing, to get, you know, substance abuse uh, counselling for the mother. And there's a common denominator in these stories that the parents are overwhelmed and or absent, you know, and, and we can blame them, you know, and we can preach about well, how terrible they are. Someone has to be blamed are, sooner or later, don't they? Yeah, well, you know, if you want to do so that. So you're now saying but we can't blame children, the parents either? Well, I'm saying that's, Is it my a, that's, fault, irrelevant, that's irrelevant to the lives the children are living, you know, and when those lives go on to impact on other people, sometimes to the extent that they end up killing people, then, you know, what's the point of blaming but, the okay, parents? So, we need to help so the children. It, at some point, though, we need to help children. It's, it, it's just a line, isn't it? It's 
some point, don't you actually have to point the finger at the problem and call for some accountability? Because if you don't do that, all you're going to be doing is saying, oh, we understand things were tough for you as well, because probably these appalling breeding machines were also the victim of appalling family situations. So are we just constantly going to make excuses for people? Until we get to the core problem, which is how do we deal with safe housing, employment, support, and a whole range of things that stop those breeding machines mm, mm. from being breeding machines. I oh, know you don't like that line, do you? When but I more use correctly, it? you know, well, you I continue am a to cut. Mm, mm. You continue to cut government I'm funding. You're not an appalling breeding machine. I can be appalling. <laughs> Um, okay, so so we we can agree on what because I don't want to leave this conversation until we've agreed on something. Well, obviously we agree that something has to be done, but we've got to get a bit closer than that. Right. Well, you continue to treat um, SIFs, social services, and these interventionist government services as costs rather than um, duties of a society to provide and investments. And you keep cutting back on them, you know. And then you talk about bringing in the company that runs the prisons to run it instead. This is the sort of result you get. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. We have to start thinking of this as an investment in our future rather than uh, using them as corporate machines that have to save money. Yeah, and absolutely, to be fair, most of these things are treated as ambulances at the bottom of the cliff. So All right, so. we will be back with the panel in just a moment. It's 23 past eight. Right, welcome back. Great to have you with us. Thanks to our partner, AMP, AUT lecturer, Ella Henry, and lawyer and political commentator, Vernon Tarver. Your two things, Vernon. Uh, join me on the panel this morning. Uh, very quickly, Ella, your advice to Colin Craig, your comments on the Conservative Party. I join the rest of the people holding pitchforks. Sit down and shut up. Mm. Stop digging. Don't sue anyone. It's hard to do. Oh, and, and he is a little bit litigious. He can be a, a little, little bit litigious. Bit. Mm. Extremely. But lots mm. of threats. Anyway. Any future for the party, do you think? Uh, it's hard to see. I don't think so. This is one of the problems with this, and we were just talking about this in the break, Ella, is that if you set up a party with such high moral principles, it's very hard to find anyone that can lead it, isn't it? Because Absolutely. how I mean, many of us truly could lead a Conservative Party if we wanted to? Political high ground is an oxymoron. Mm, mm, that's oh. right. Oh, I love it. No, <laughs> let's leave it there. Um, right, let's talk about, um, in a moment we're going to talk about dangerous clothes, but the super city budget, is it ever okay, um, Vernon, you're a councillor, you're an elected official, um, albeit in a very tiny capacity, um, is it ever okay for an elected uh, official to abstain from a vote? Look, I think there needs to be a really exceptional reason. Um, I think uh, some people are just trying to have a bob each way so they can go back to their voters and say, oh, I didn't support it, but I didn't want to create a crisis, so I abstained. Mm. I think it's pretty weak, and I think you need to, on something as significant as the budget, yeah. you know, which is the money, uh, then, then you've got to make a choice. And it, well, there's a bottom is, line here. If the government spineless. refused to kick in for the very expensive infrastructure that we need for this city to go any further um, in transport, then we're all going to have to pay the costs. So let's let's look at who's actually largely responsible well, for this. Well, and you're, so you're blaming the government? You can blame the councillors if you want. Well, but of course you've got to, to blame the councillors. They're at the coalface, so it's the councillors that should be saying this rather than saying they're going to abstain. If yeah, they absolutely. don't like the budget absolutely. and they don't want to be seen to be supporting it, then they should vote against the budget. You've been and elected to stand for something and you've got to do that. Absolutely. Ella? Um, I think, too, that with an election coming up, everybody's being very careful about their political oh, yeah. agendas. But yeah. the reality, truth be told, if you look at how many people in Auckland voters, nobody actually cares out mm. there. Oh, that's until right. they get the These race people pill. will get away with it. Let's just name them quickly. Cathy Kay. Well, God, how long has she had her face in the trough? Seriously? Uh, Kathy Casey, uh, Ross Clough. Is it Clough? From the foul. No. Oh. Um, John Watson and Wayne Walker. Those are the people who have said that they're prepared to abstain. You know, don't vote for them ever, ever, ever again. Um, all right, Ella, skinny jeans and other dangerous items of clothing. It's not surprising if you wear clothing like that, you're going to have a problem. Well, in terms of skinny jeans, I am of the view that if you can hear the wind whistling between your thighs, mm -hmm. then probably skinny jeans are appropriate. But if you cannot, then stay away. But I think the reason that people wear um, skinny jeans is so they can hear on the odd occasion the wind whistling between their thighs. <laughs> once <laughs> what, more. What are you, once more. Um, what do you think, Vernon? Uh, you know, it was an interesting story. I think maybe, um, you know, when you're into the 12th hour and you're beginning to feel like numbness in your legs, it might be a good idea to maybe, you know, know change your pants. I take the jeans off. For goodness off. sake. In fact, and here's, but her mistake was when she first started to feel numbness and lose the ability to move, <laughs> she should perhaps in the very early stages have peeled off the jeans. You know, that's, um, you know, that's what I'd say. But so there you go. So it's not so much, so is the consensus here that it's not so much skinny jeans that are injurious to your health, it's stupidity. 
Yeah, mm. quite possibly. Okay. I'll right. go with that. Um, Vernon Tava, Ella Henry, thank you both very much for joining us. We will see you again soon, I hope. Right now.